begin by discussing electric magnetic waves, define what I mean by the term bandwidth, distinguish the definition of bandwidth that I'm using from another common use of the word bandwidth, perform some example calculations, and then give some bandwidths of common network media. The way that I'm going to define bandwidth is that it is a physical layer property. This is a property that exists at layer one of the OSI model. In order to begin discussing bandwidth, we first need to discuss electromagnetic waves. The electromagnetic waves are common throughout the universe. These include waves such as radio waves, invisible and infrared light. And humans for a number of years have been using these types of electromagnetic waves. Certainly, whenever we look at something, we are seeing visible light reflected off that object. Our eyes are sensitive to electromagnetic radiation in the so-called visible spectrum. And we're able to see that. Radio, we use for radio and television broadcasting. We've used that for quite some time now. now these electromagnetic waves, in general, propagate through space at the speed of light. In other words, they travel at the speed of light through a vacuum. In other materials, they travel slightly slower than the speed of light, but for our purposes, they travel near enough to the speed of light that that slight slowdown caused by the material is irrelevant. We can characterize waves by their amplitude and by their frequency. Now, the amplitude of an electromagnetic wave measures the height of the wave whenever we plot a representation of that wave on a graph. Here I'm measuring the height from the center line, and I can see that this wave has a height that goes up to 1 from the center line, which is at 0. In communications, this wave height, this amplitude, directly corresponds to the strength or power of the transmitted signal. So if I'm transmitting a signal of, let's say, 1 watt of power, then this wave having an amplitude of 1 could be said to have 1 watt of power. If I were to transmit with 2 watts of power, I would have a higher amplitude signal. So this thin blue line here, or this taller wave, is an example of a higher amplitude signal. It's a taller wave when it's plotted. The red line is the original wave, which alternates between minus 1 and plus 1. Now, in addition to varying the amplitude of a wave, I can also look at the frequency of a wave. And the frequency of a wave measures how many full cycles of a wave occur per unit time. So a full cycle of a wave is how long it takes to get back to the same part of the waveform. So if I start here at the end of my blue arrow, and I go up, and then I come back down, and then I come back up until I reach the center line again, that is one cycle, or one period, of a wave. And however many of these cycles occur per unit time gives me the frequency of the wave. And the standard time unit that we use for measuring the frequency is one second. And the standard unit that we use for frequency is one cycle of a wave per second, or one hertz. Now if we have a wave that goes up down and comes back more frequently within the same time span, then we say that wave is a higher frequency wave. More cycles per unit time is a higher frequency. So a 100 hertz wave, for example, is a higher frequency than a 1 hertz wave. And in my example, the wave in blue is a higher frequency wave than the wave in red, because in the time span of this plot, the blue line, representing the blue wave, goes up and down and completes more cycles in that same amount of time than does the red wave. Now, different physical materials at the physical layer can carry different frequencies at limited power levels. Not every type of material that we have can carry every frequency of electromagnetic wave and not every material that we have is compatible with every amplitude or every power of electromagnetic wave. For example, if I take an optical fiber cable, this is a cable made of glass or plastic, which does not conduct electricity very well. 
An optical fiber cable would not transmit an electrical signal very well unless I sent an extremely high amplitude electrical signal, enough to overcome the resistance of the non-conductive plastic or glass. And if I sent a signal with that much power, that signal would actually probably be transferred through the air around the conductor and it would probably damage the cable in the process. So I can't use an optical fiber to send an electrical signal. Conversely, I can't take a copper wire and send an optical signal down it. In other words, I can't take a laser light, attach it to the end of a copper wire, and expect the light to come out the other end of the wire. That won't happen because the copper wire, while it carries electrical signals well, cannot carry an electromagnetic signal and within the visible light range because it's too high frequency of signal. So the way that we measure bandwidth depends upon whether we're talking about a cabled or wired connection or a wireless connection. The bandwidth of a cabled or non-wireless connection is the difference between the highest frequency signal and the lowest frequency signal that the material can carry reliably. And this difference is expressed in hertz, but we can use SI prefixes as shorthand to abbreviate, say, 1000 hertz as 1 kilohertz. With wireless, it's slightly more complicated because wireless transmitting devices use part of the radio spectrum, and governments around the world regulate this radio spectrum and say who can use what pieces of it or what frequencies in it for what purpose. So the bandwidth of a wireless physical connection is the difference between the upper and lower frequency that a single channel can use in the legally allocated radio frequency range for the wireless device. So a wireless device cannot operate outside of its legally allocated radio frequency range or its legally allocated band without violating the laws of the country that it's operating in. In the United States, for example, the Federal Communications Commission regulates radio frequency spectrum and there are substantial fines and even possible federal prison time for transmitting on frequencies that have not been properly assigned to you. Therefore, with wireless, our limitations actually wind up being more legal limitations than technical ones. Again, this bandwidth is expressed in hertz, and we may have SI prefixes in front of the hertz. Now, I've defined bandwidth as a physical property measured in hertz. This is the so-called analog bandwidth that signal processing folks use. In networking, the term bandwidth often gets casually used to mean so-called digital bandwidth. And this digital bandwidth term refers to the maximum data speed or the maximum data rate that a given connection can carry. And this can be measured at any layer of the OSI model and is expressed in bits per second. The problem with this term is that nobody says analog bandwidth or digital bandwidth. And when we're being precise about the entire networking system, it can get confusing which type of bandwidth is under discussion. Sometimes it's obvious from the context, sometimes it isn't. So to avoid confusion, I'm going to be calling this quantity, or the so-called digital bandwidth quantity in bits per second, the maximum throughput of the connection. And I'll be reserving the term bandwidth for its analog signal processing definition with units and hertz. There is a relationship between these two quantities, however, because the maximum throughput is related to the bandwidth. And as a rule of thumb, the higher the bandwidth of a physical medium, the more data it can carry per unit time. However, that maximum throughput is still limited by some other factors, such as the noise and the capability of the transmitters and receivers, and so bandwidth alone does not determine the maximum throughput. So let's do some bandwidth calculations. Here's a simple calculation. Suppose that a physical medium can reliably carry signals between 1 kilohertz and 10 kilohertz. Well, to get the bandwidth, I simply subtract the upper frequency, 10 kilohertz, and I subtract the lower frequency, 1 kilohertz, from that upper frequency. So I take 10 kilohertz, subtract 1 kilohertz, I get 9 kilohertz. Now, the 1 kilohertz 
reported value has one significant figure because there's only one digit. The 10 kilohertz reported value only has one significant figure because there's only one digit to the left of the decimal point that isn't zero. So any zeros between the last non-zero digit and the decimal point are not significant values, not significant figures, unless the decimal point is actually there. The decimal point is not here in this particular example, so I only have one significant figure here. No matter though, because I only have one significant figure here, and my final result needs to use the lower of the significant figures that have been given. In this case, it's going to be one significant figure, so 9 kilohertz is perfectly okay as my final answer. In the second example, I have a different physical medium that can carry signals between 100 hertz and 1.2 gigahertz, 1.20 gigahertz to be specific. I have three significant figures in this value. So 1.20 gigahertz is equal to 1 billion 200 million hertz or in British English 1,200 million hertz. If I subtract 1 hertz from the 1.2 gigahertz value, I get 1,199,900 I'm sorry, 1,199,999,900 hertz or 1,199,999,900 hertz. I can't use this answer though as my final answer because my given quantities, I had three significant figures here, but I only had one significant figure here. What this means is that the person who said that, oh yeah, this, this medium can support 100 hertz, might have been saying that it can support 99.97 hertz, or might have been saying that it can support 105 hertz or 110 hertz, and they simply rounded down. So what I need to do is I need to round this final answer to one significant figure, which means I can only have one digit left of the decimal point that isn't zero. So I'm going to first truncate all these nines because I'm only going to look to the digit immediately right of this first digit in order to do my rounding. And I can see I have a one here that rounds down, and so I'm going to report my bandwidth as only one gigahertz. Now here's some common bandwidths of some actual technologies. A voice-only line with a plain old telephone system has a nominal bandwidth of about 3 kilohertz. A telephone digital subscriber line using the ADSL2 Plus standard increases that nominal bandwidth to 2.2 megahertz. If I'm using a single wireless channel following the 802.11g specification, I can have a 20 megahertz nominal bandwidth. In Video DSL2, which is an extension of the digital subscriber line technology, supports 30 MHz bandwidth. The 802.11n standard provides an optional way to use a single channel of 40 MHz bandwidth. That's still less than a Category 5 Ethernet cable, however, which has 100 MHz nominal bandwidth. The newest standard, or newest at the time that I recorded this lecture, and this should give you an idea of the age of this lecture by the time you watch it. The newest 802.11 AC standard, optionally spanning the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands, can support a single channel with a nominal bandwidth of 160 megahertz. But that's still less than the equivalent new form of wired ethernet with category 6 ethernet cable at 250 megahertz, or double to 500 megahertz for category 6A cable. That's still far less than an RG400 coaxial cable, which can carry a nominal bandwidth of 31.5 gigahertz. And this is all significantly less than what we can do with fiber optics. A short length of optical fiber, for example, has a nominal bandwidth of 9.9 .9 petahertz. So we can get a lot more bandwidth using optical technologies at the moment with our current technology than we can with the radio frequency technologies. So to summarize, bandwidth is a physical layer property that measures the difference between the highest and lowest frequencies that a medium can carry. 
This is a distinct value from the maximum throughput, even though the word bandwidth is thrown around in networking all the time to mean maximum throughput. But there is a relationship. A higher bandwidth physical layer tends to support a higher data throughput at the physical layer, and a lower bandwidth physical layer will have the effect of reducing the speed of the connection.